All right, back to the paper. Uh, we're coming towards the end of question five almost. We've got here um, the first question that is of um, the nature of a recursive sequence. So it says a sequence is defined by a n equals, and then you can see you get a n by looking at the previous term, uh, a n minus one. You do make some changes to it, you double it, and then you do some other stuff to do with whatever part of the sequence you're up to, okay? So there's the definition of the sequence. Because it's a recursive sequence, you need to know a starting point, like a seed, okay, you start at two, and then just keep on doing the pattern on and on. And what you're asked to prove is that this is the general formula for integers um, n is greater than or equal to one. So how do we go about this? Again, even though it is not stated explicitly, I hope you remember, this is a perfect tool for mathematical induction. Um, how could you know that without having just like memorized it? Um, you're looking at an integer sequence. Um, you're looking at going from one term to the next. Um, and so we can, we, we also have something that looks very suspiciously like a base case that sort of establishes this is how it works and this is how it continues. So even though the words proved by mathematical induction do not appear anywhere in this question, there were enough clues within the question to nudge you in that direction. So let's have a look at the solution now. The way I started was I said, okay, well, I'm going to test just like I bring in any other proof by induction. I've got n equals one. And what I do is I say, well, right, let's have a look at the, uh, what the recursive formula tells us. Recalling that recursive, the recursive formula um, is this value over here, um, uh, this expression rather, this function. I'm going to put in, um, you know, a equals one, um, which means I've got a sub one minus one, which is a zero, which I already have established. So I get that. That's what I do from the recursive formula, and then I check the um, thing that I'm trying to prove. I, I check it for the base case. Now, you can see this is the result I'm trying to prove. So what I do is I say, and I label it by the way, from this, from this particular formula, let's see what happens if I put in one now. n equals one, what do I get? I get two plus three plus one, which is six, the same thing that the recursive formula told me. So that's a really promising sign. Uh, I've got my base case, it works. The assumption hardly takes any time at all, uh, but then I get into the proof step. Now, it doesn't take that many lines of working, certainly far less than the previous proof by induction that we saw. And that's because, as I pointed out at the beginning of this question, recursive formulas are kind of built for proof by induction because Induction is itself a recursive process. It sort of establishes something and then looks back at that and then uses that uh, to establish a new thing and then looks back at that. So because mathematical induction is recursive by nature, recursive formulas are just mincemeat for this particular method. So here is me, um, whoopsie daisy, here is me um, writing out the k plus one case. Uh, and then what I do is I use the recursive formula to see what happens. If I say a sub k plus one, and then I sort of evaluate there using um, the formula as presented. And at this point I say, hold on, my assumption has to do with this a k term right there. Okay, see there it is, a k. And what I'm doing is I'm substituting it for this two to the k plus three k plus one. So that's why you can see it appears here. And I've sort of separated it in the brackets and I've said by assumption, which you do always do in a proof by mathematical induction to clarify your communication. Once I've done that, it's just a matter of expanding and collecting like terms. So you can see it unfolds here. Um, all of the two to the k terms, is that's, that's all of them, right? I've got these, um, these k terms, there's six k that comes from here, minus three k, it simplifies out, and then plus two plus two equals four. And that's it. So really all of the challenges were on the interpretation. The, the actual proof by mathematical induction itself is very, very straightforward. Um, but knowing how to read a recursive formula, keep doing that by accident, read a recursive formula, um, and then to use that to incorporate that into your proof by mathematical induction, that was the only part of that that was tricky. All right, final question in uh, number five. Within the set of integers, prove by the contrapositive that if n squared minus 6n plus 5 is even, then n is odd. So this is a classic number theory or discrete mathematics question to do, um, something to do with number parity, evenness and oddness. So um, you even get given the specific method that's prescribed proved by the contrapositive. So how does this work? Well, the first thing you need to know is what is the contrapositive of this particular statement? Once you've got that, what you wanna do is use that, prove it, and then once you've proven the contrapositive, that is logically equivalent to proving the original statement. So let's see at what that looks like. Here comes question 5e. E. So here's the original statement, right? So the contrapositive of 
P implies Q. The contrapositive of that is to, uh, to get the negation of everything and then reverse the order. So it would be uh, not Q implies not P. Now you can see how I've done this, right? Um, if I'm calling this part P, then not P would be n squared minus 6n plus 5 is odd, which sure enough is what you can see down here on the end. So there's my not P. And then what is not Q? Well, if Q is N is odd, then not Q is N is even. So you can see what I've done there is I've taken uh, this one, I've negated it and put it first. And then exactly the same way, there's this one, I've negated it and then I put it last. So happy times. This is the contrapositive and uh, now I can work with it. So if N is even, what does that mean? Well, I state n equals 2p. That's a nice generic way to talk about any even kind of numbers. Don't forget to specify that p itself has to be an integer. Otherwise, you could have 2 times a half, and that's not an even number. And then I say, well, in, if, if n equals 2p, what does that tell me about n squared minus 6n plus 5? So I do my substitution in here. Um, and what I'm trying to show is that n squared plus, minus 6n plus 5 is odd. Well, an odd number is of the form you know, an even number plus one or an even number minus one. So if I can get it into that arrangement, I'm good to go. So I do my substitution, I expand out, and I notice, oh, I've got all these even terms here. If I factorize out the two, it becomes very obvious. So I've done that, and then it's plus one, right? But then what I notice is this guy here, um, it must be also itself an even number. Oh, sorry, rather not an even number, but a whole number, right? If p is a whole number, then squaring it, doubling it, subtracting, etc., you still end up with an integer. So therefore, you can see in this line, I have firmly established n squared minus 6n plus 5. It's double an integer plus 1. Uh, this is the particular integer that's being doubled. So therefore, it must be odd if I started with the assumption that n was even. So I've proved the contrapositive. That means that the original result, which is logically equivalent, is done. So that was the trickiest part of this question, I think. The algebra wasn't complicated, but you needed to know what the contrapositive was and what its logical relation to the original statement also was.